For several months, the world has been consumed with one burning question. Why hasn't Vex uploaded for over three months? Well, the truth is really quite obvious. The, the North Korean government is trying to kill me. Ever since traveling to North Korea, it's been obvious I've been under watch. For the past few months, I've been hiding in the one place the North Korean spies won't be able to find me. The Icelandic wilderness. You see, the Icelandic tundra is the perfect location to hide. Iceland is located in the corner of the world, just a few miles south of the Arctic Circle. Any further north in solo human habitation would be dang near impossible. They can only get me a few months of the year when the place isn't barricaded by snow. You might just think I'm a YouTuber gone insane and paranoid, but I'm not. After all, the North Korean government has shown they don't play by the rules. They will go to any length to eliminate anyone opposing their regime. Take for instance Kim Jong-nam, true heir to the Korean throne, assassinated in broad daylight in an international airport by North Korean spies. Bam gone in 15 seconds. If I'm not safe in a secured place with hundreds of witnesses, then the obvious place to hide is the wilderness. I've thought of every detail and this place is perfect. You see, the regime's assassination weapon of choice is the banned chemical known as VX Nerve Agent. One breath of that and it's all over. The chemical weapon has one weakness though, a melting point of 3.9 degrees Celsius. If it doesn't melt and turn into vapor, it's essentially rendered useless. Icelandic volcanic activity has resulted in overabundance of hot springs, my only refuge during the bitter cold freezing winter months. Access to a plethora of crystal clear, fast flowing water helps sustain my inevitably doomed life. Additionally, boiled volcanic water is able to kill off remaining bacteria and parasites. All this manages to keep me alive. The natural beauty of the heath keeps me calm and gives me sanity during my otherwise torturous and meaningless solitary existence. Every once in a while, my memories of North Korea resurface, triggering my post-traumatic stress disorder, sending me into a violent, unstoppable rampage. But at least hundreds of miles from civilization, people are safe from me and I'm only a danger to myself. Survival isn't easy. There's hardly any food out here and no way to cook it. A lot of people have done some pretty stupid things in their lives, and I can say, by far, one of the most idiotic things I've ever done was illegally entering North Korea. I haven't talked about this before because it really doesn't feel real when I say I went to North Korea. It just doesn't seem like it actually happened. And not only that, I was almost caught illegally entering North Korea and sent to a prison camp. And I suppose now I see two versions of myself. One version is standing safe and sound right here in front of the camera talking like almost nothing is wrong and there's another version of me still in North Korea in a prison camp somewhere probably doing a lifetime of hard labor and it's just hard to see that my life could have split into these two paths and I'm here right now and the other path doesn't seem like it was ever a possibility but it really was you see just a few months ago I had this plan this plan was to go to North Korea take as much video and photos as I can document it and upload it for the world to see However, I'm a YouTuber and without approval from the North Korean government, what I would be doing would be illegal because technically this would be considered journalism and entering North Korea on a tourist visa to do journalism is, ooh, that's a really bad idea. So I was just a naive 20 year old with a YouTube channel and I still am. I lied about the fact I was a YouTuber and why I was really planning to go to North Korea. I wasn't really going to North Korea to see North Korea. I was doing it so I could produce some sort of video for you guys. You see, I was really almost caught while I was there. I aroused a lot of suspicion. I was warned multiple times. It was not a good situation that I was in. But in the process of doing so, I got some good video of North Korea, which is, I think, somewhat important. Maybe you've heard of Otto Warmbier. If you haven't, he was a 21-year-old university student from Ohio, and he went to North Korea and with the intention to do something illegal just like I was. And he stole a poster, and he was arrested at the airport, and shortly after that he was killed by the regime. You see, me and Otto kind of have a similar story. We were both university students, both American. We were both traveling to North Korea for the exact same tour, the New Year's Eve tour. He was 21, I was 20. We both stayed in the Yangakdo Hotel, except we were exactly one year apart from each other. We both had the intention of doing something illegal when we came. In my case, it was to record unauthorized video. In his case, it was to steal a poster. He went during the 2015 tour. I went during the 2016 slash 2017 tour. The one difference between us though is that he was caught for what he was doing and I wasn't. I traveled to North Korea while he was currently arrested. No one had heard from him, but at the time no one knew that he was secretly brain dead, being basically kept alive on feeding tubes before the North Korean regime returned him to America. Weird things started happening to me almost immediately 
after landing in Pyongyang. It seems like a relatively normal airport, Pyongyang airport, just like any other international airport, except most of the people there aren't really people, they're just soldiers. We were the only flight arriving and we were the only foreigners there. You may have heard North Korea has a major power problem. They don't have enough electricity. If you just look at them from a satellite image, you can see they're basically a dark spot on the world. I had purchased two $50 bottles of alcohol in China, which I had brought to Pyongyang with the intention of gifting to the tour guides, which is kind of customary. We collected our baggage and waited for the rest of the tour group to collect their baggage before passing through immigration. The last thing I remember about that bag of alcohol was it was sitting next to my luggage in front of the conveyor belt when all of a sudden everything just went pitch black. We had been warned that blackouts were a really common occurrence in North Korea, but this one even took our Chinese guides who were experts off guard because they had never witnessed a blackout in the international airport, which is supposed to have special reserves of electricity. The airport blacking out here is really unusual. There was no emergency lighting whatsoever. The only light in the airport was coming from people's phones and their flashlights. After five minutes, the lights come back on and everyone continues on normal as if nothing had happened, except I noticed that my bag of alcohol was missing. I search around the baggage area looking for the alcohol. There's nothing. I ask a bunch of the tourists. No one has seen it. No one's touched it. So the Chinese guides advised me to go to this lost and found office, which is pretty empty. There's just like one person there who probably never gets anyone. And I go into the office and I tell them my alcohol's missing. I don't tell them it's stolen, but it's pretty obvious at this point that it's been stolen. There's really nowhere it could have gone. Half an hour later, the lost and found office calls me back and they managed to locate the bag amazingly, right? Except the bag is completely empty as in the alcohol has been taken out and it's just now an empty bag. The bag's obviously been looted, and they just hand me the bag and smile as if nothing had happened. I ask what happened to the alcohol inside and whether it's been stolen. They just shrug, saying no one's ever had anything stolen from the airport before, so I guess that would mean I'm a first, or maybe they're saying mine wasn't stolen, it was just misplaced. But either way, they were trying not to make a big deal out of it, and they weren't being very helpful, so being in North Korea, all I could really do was say, well, thank you for the bag, smile, nod, and leave. We both acted like nothing had happened and we went our separate ways. The only thing I could be happy was that it wasn't my suitcase. So it's pretty obvious that when the lights blacked out, a soldier, who was the only person who could have taken it, picked up the bag and just walked away. It's really kind of a perfect crime because there was no lighting and obviously CCTV wasn't working because there was no electricity and no one could have seen anything and the soldiers can really do whatever they want. Passing through immigration is where I was really getting scared because immigration Immigration in North Korea is the make it or break it point. There's no in between. This is where people get arrested, either when entering or leaving the country. You might think for the whole trip that everything is fine until you're the last person in line at the airport and they say you can't go through and they just escort you away to a room and nobody really notices you're missing until everybody's already on the flight. The baggage search is definitely the worst part because this is where they found Otto Warmbier's poster and as soon as they did that they just escorted him away and he was never seen again. I was scared simply because the amount of camera and microphone equipment I had in my bag would kind of give away the fact that I wasn't just an amateur photographer or anything and that I might have been a professional videographer or journalist. They pulled out of my bag a Canon 70D, a GoPro, a head strap, a laptop, a shotgun microphone, a camera tripod, a Blue Yeti microphone, batteries, and 500 gigabytes worth of SD cards. I had a lot of gear with me which was really quite stupid because it wasn't subtle at all. The soldier searching me definitely knew that what I was bringing was basically professional equipment in a lot of it for a five day trip only. During this whole search, my heart was basically pounding, adrenaline was going through my body, and I was just trying my best to appear calm, collected, and act like I wasn't feeling anything. The soldier turned around to me and straight up just looked at me and said, why do you have so much equipment? Are you a journalist? And obviously this was the question where if you answer yes to, you get escorted away, and if you say no, maybe you'll be okay. So I just told them no, it's just some Christmas presents that I'd recently gotten. I wanted to test them out while I was here. I told them I just wanted to capture as much of North Korea as possible because this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And apparently I hadn't given away how scared I was because he just nodded and acted like it was nothing. Had I answered yes to his questions, I would have been arrested on the spot for being a journalist under a tourist visa in North Korea, and I don't think I would have been treated too kindly for that. At the time, me and the soldier were basically in two different mental states. I was in complete panic, and he was probably completely bored just searching tourists. I just found it amazing how, despite being in two different mental states, neither of us gave anything away. Taking video in North Korea was surprisingly difficult and extremely stressful, but not really for the reasons I expect. You see, most of the problems didn't come from the North Koreans, but from the actual other tourists there. You see, most of the people who travel to North Korea aren't exactly the youngest. I'd say most are within their middle age towards retirement age. Me being only 20, I was actually the second youngest person there out of the 300 or so who were staying in the Yangakdo Hotel at the time. On top of this, me vlogging and doing a lot of video recording caused me to stand out 
quite substantially. And a lot of them actually ended up making me a bit of a meme. In fact, mocking me and not being very nice to me because I was standing out so much by recording a lot of the tour. Because I was doing something different, I stood out from everybody else. And because of this, I noticed people started excluding me. Whenever I'd sit down to drink, people wouldn't be very welcoming. Whenever I'd sit next to them on the bus or try to strike up a conversation, they wouldn't be very eager to engage with me. In fact, they would quickly try to end the conversation and it was pretty clear they weren't very interested in talking to me. In fact, sometimes as I was walking through the hotel, other tourists would walk past me and they would mockingly shout out that, oh, you must be so popular and that, oh, people are going to love your videos. Really, they were just being sarcastic and kind of not very nice. Of course, I hadn't told anyone at the time that I was a YouTuber because if I had done so, it would have put me under risk. So to them, I was just a nobody filming myself and kind of being a little bit unusual. In fact, I was urged several times during the tour by other tourists, just, just put the camera down. Just listen, just stop wasting your time with this. You're just enjoy North Korea. Well, I got my answer, kind of. Can you turn the thing up your head? Yeah, sure. <laughs> really want me not to? Yeah. In fact, I believe on the last day, I was talking to a French guy who was maybe age 30 to 35, and he had told me, your life must be very sad if you have all the time to go home and review this video. The level of hate I got just for recording video really struck me off guard because this wasn't what I expected in North Korea, especially not from tourists. I expected my main problems to be from the North Koreans. Being excluded, called names, sarcastic comments even when I walked past groups of people, that was all the kind of stuff that I faced while being there. In fact, this actually kind of reminds me a lot of high school except the people are 50 and 60 years old except making jokes at the expense of a 20 year old. A lot of people would say the high school mentality ends after high school but something really valuable I learned from this experience was that it can happen with anyone at any age in any place. In fact, this was probably one of the most demotivating things during the whole time. Several times I was kind of about ready to give up, about ready to stop recording myself, but then I decided, okay, I need to power through this, just ignore the comments and all the thoughts of everybody else, and not let what middle-aged people think of me stop me from doing what I know is right. One of the worst parts of this whole experience was being mockingly called a YouTuber, while in fact I actually was, but couldn't tell anybody because if I did then I could be arrested. Every time a drunk middle-aged person came up to me and told me to stop doing what I'm doing, it frustrated me so much because I was angry at these people. I just wanted to say, look, I'm 20 years old and I've done more in my life than you've done in possibly your entire life and I just couldn't do it. I just had to pretend like I was an amateur, like I had amounted to nothing and that I was just doing this for a hobby or for fun. In fact, I had to play along with the stereotype of being an amateur because the more amateurish and idiotic I looked, the less likely I would be to be held at the airport for potentially being a journalist. There's a really bitter feeling that comes with being mocked by others and having to pretend that their misguided judgments about yourself are actually the truth. An issue I consider completely different from recording myself was the recording of other people, which also posed quite a problem. I avoided this, but honestly, no matter what I could do, a westerner or something would often end up in the background of my video, which honestly even I didn't want because it kind of ruins the experience of North Korea. What really irked me out about North Korea is the fact that the tourists there would get really mad at you if they somehow accidentally ended up in the background of your video. One instance of this was when I was in an elevator, just walking around with a GoPro on my head, seeing what activities the hotel had to offer. When in the elevator from a group of people, a lady stopped me and asked me if I was recording. Of course, I, I told her I was, and she told me to immediately stop recording. I'll come in there, guys. Are you going down? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're going down. Yeah. Woo! That's not on. Uh, it is. Can you turn it off? I don't yeah. want to be filmed. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Normally it isn't such a problem to ask someone to stop recording you and let that be that, but you have to remember this is North Korea and the more you think about it, the more stupid it kind of becomes. First of all, you're in North Korea, you travel to the least free country in the world and you have any expectation of privacy whatsoever. Secondly, there's a camera in the elevator recording video and audio at all times. Thirdly, the Yangakto Hotel actually has an entire floor dedicated to monitoring guests 24 hours a day seven days a week. Fourthly, my GoPro videos were around one hour each and no one really cares about a random tourist in the background of the video. Nobody cares about who you are or the fact you're in an elevator. The ironic part about asking me not to record you and to end my recording is that now you have differentiated yourself from the hundreds of other people in the video. You've now stepped into the limelight and you've made yourself stand out. It's funny because this video was honestly extremely uninteresting 
and would have just sat on my hard drive for probably a few years before it's deleted. And the fact that you asked me to stop recording you, you're now one of the only pieces of evidence I have of the complications I was facing from other tourists. By far the worst experience I had with tourists in North Korea was when I was just standing alone in a bar having a drink by myself. When a large group of tourists mobbed me and forced me into the corner of the bar and took out their cell phones and started recording me with their flashlights on. They forced me against the wall and this was a demeaning high school mentality attack against me. The best thing I could do in this situation when mobbed by other people recording me was just act like it didn't bother me and then I was totally fine with it and I was totally in on the joke, right? I have no issue with people recording me ever, but the fact that you organized this attack on me in such a patronizing way and wanted to demean me by doing it just didn't sit right with me. That's some high school level crap. And I really don't think anyone would appreciate that, and that certainly wasn't what I was doing to other people. Before you go to North Korea, you have to go through China because the only planes from North Korea actually land in China. Before I went to North Korea and China, I had to sign this contract, and everyone has to sign this contract. Basically, it says you're not a journalist, you're not a religious prosthetizer, and that any footage you release or photos afterwards have to be pre-approved before being released. Basically, the problem is the North Korean government doesn't want negative footage or negative pictures being released from the country, but they really have no power to stop people once they're outside North Korea. So the North Korean government found an interesting solution to this dilemma. You see, only certain tour companies are allowed to actually take tourists to North Korea. And if any journalists travel with these companies, then that company essentially gets a ban from taking tourists abroad. And that's happened before. So in order to stop leaks of negative photos or video, the travel companies essentially have you sign a piece of paper that says you can be sued if you release video that causes future harm to their company. So essentially, if you go to film or or take photos in North Korea, the only stuff that can be released is positive information about North Korea. So North Korea solved this problem really cleverly by using travel companies to censor information in a completely legal way. There's actually plenty of examples of this happening. Just take, for instance, this video by National Geographic of a North Korean ski resort. It has 2 million views and it actually makes North Korea look like an amazing place to travel to. They have drone shots, beautiful scenery, slow motion footage, sport. It actually makes North Korea look amazing. That's some nice steep slopes. You can go get some speed on that. Basement where all the excitement of the hotel happens. There you go. That's it. Hold that. Toes up. <laughs> but because National Geographic is only allowed to release positive video of North Korea, this is essentially propaganda because it's one-sided. You only see the positive part and never the negative. If National Geographic was to travel there and end up releasing negative video or information about North Korea, the government would ban any of their journalists or members of their company from traveling to the country again and never being able to film again. Because of this, they wouldn't be able to make videos in the future, so really, if you think about it, National Geographic, just like any other company, has money as their number one interest and not really journalistic integrity. Another instance is Fun for Louis, a YouTuber who traveled there and vlogged there. His vlogs made North Korea look like a fun and amazing place to travel to. There's not enough surfboards, but when... I want you, I want you to join it. In fact, there was no criticisms or warning about North Korea in that entire video of his. Philip DeFranco actually criticized Fun for Louis pretty badly for having sugarcoated the country and not offered any critical perspective of what's going on there. The problem that a lot of people are having, though, is that by just focusing on the positive of North Korea, on these very curated, very controlled tours where they show you what they want you to see, it effectively becomes North Korean propaganda, which is terrible because North Korea is one of the most repressive countries out there. You're purposefully presenting it in this positive light, which is actually bad. Is my personal opinion is I think that he didn't talk about the negative stuff because he doesn't want to screw over the guy that got him there. I mean, we're talking about a country where people 
people have visited, they spoke out against the country, they then visited again, and then they get life in prison. And so did other news articles, because what Fun for Louis had released was actually propaganda, because everything was positive and there was nothing at all negative about the country. Fun for Louis then went on to defend his vlog, saying he's not about political commentary, and that he just wants to have upbeat and happy videos about everywhere he goes. Hey guys, I'm making a video today to respond to the massive amount of criticism I've had over my North Korea vlogs. I am not a investigative journalist, I don't really do political commentary. He briefly touched on not wanting to jeopardize the non-profit organization who helped them get there, because doing so would possibly restrict their travel in the future. So I want to explain how I ended up going on the trip now. My friend Lane posted on Facebook that he was going or wanted to go, so I contacted him and found out that he was going with an organization that were running their third annual surf school. So the guy organising these trips has been visiting North Korea for 17 years, doing humanitarian relief work. He doesn't work for the government, but he has been building a relationship with the government and with the people there. And I don't want to jeopardise any of the work that he's done with the content I've been creating. What he failed to mention was that he signed a contract, just like me, prohibiting any negative content about North Korea ever being released. But the one thing that irks me is the fact that he claims his video are not propaganda. Propaganda is presenting only one side of a story, and by basis the contract he signed only allowed him to release one side of the story. So what he did release was indeed propaganda. Definitely makes what Fun for Louis did despicable because he was only really telling a half-truth the entire time. He never told us the full story. He never even warned people or told people that maybe you shouldn't travel to North Korea. If you look at the statistics, around 800 Americans travel to North Korea every year. In this year, three Americans have been detained and not released. So 800 divided by three is about 260. So there's a one in 260 chance of an American traveling to North Korea and being held in a prison camp, having their human rights taken away from them and possibly even killed as in the case of Otto Warmbier. Louis, you need to understand that any video you make will have consequences down the line. Your videos, Louis, definitely did encourage people, not just me, to travel to North Korea, and you put them at unnecessary risk. By far the most dangerous thing I did in North Korea was sneak out of the designated area on New Year's Eve. You see, we'd been taken to an ice sculpture exhibit just outside Kim Il-sung Square, which is right across from this place. It's like a big library, and it looks like a big palace. All right, so Kim Il-sung Square is this place where you ever see pictures of North Korean military parades? Well, that's where they're held, so it's kind of a sacred place to the North Koreans. Because it was New Year's Eve, the whole plaza in the ice sculpture area was especially popular, so soldiers were actually blocking the crowds and doing crowd control, only allowing people in and out when there was enough space for people to move. So there's soldiers absolutely littered everywhere, and I start recording with my GoPro. To my surprise, the North Korean guides for once had told us we were allowed to roam around on our own, but we were not allowed to leave the smaller ice sculpture plaza. This was basically the only amount of freedom we'd been given since we'd been in North Korea, and it honestly felt really amazing just to do my own thing for once. And even this freedom had been granted out of necessity rather than goodwill because it was so crowded the North Korean guides couldn't even keep tabs on us anymore. So that was really their only choice. Okay, the ice sculptures are great, but I see the Grand Palace off to one side lit up beautifully at night. And I want to go there. Only issue is there's soldiers littered absolutely everywhere, and it's illegal for a Westerner to walk around on their own without a guide with them. Of course, I don't look Korean, but I'm wearing a hat and a scarf, and I can conceal my face pretty well, I think just enough to the fact that I would look indistinguishable from everybody else. Everybody, even the Koreans, are basically trapped in this plaza because the soldiers are blocking exit because it's too crowded. So I come up with a plan, the plan is, because it's dark, and I have clothing covering most of my face, if I just walk into the middle of one of the Korean crowds waiting to cross the street, then I can probably walk out on my own without being recognized. So just in case, I talk to the GoPro and I say, all right guys, I'm really not sure if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm pretty sure I am, even though I know I'm really not. That's just kind of an alibi. I would like to cross the street, but I'm a little worried because uh, the military, I don't know what their instructions mean when they let people cross. So I don't want to get in trouble by crossing at the wrong time. And then maybe uh, they'll stop me and delete my footage. Yeah, we can't exit right now. We have to wait for the soldiers to let us through. Kind of don't want to cross though. Fuck it, YOLO. Now this is the plaza, there's so many soldiers here. It 
at one point I even just say YOLO to the camera because I'm like, alright, I'm just gonna go for this. This is what I want. Fuck it, YOLO. Even if I do get caught, I can probably just claim ignorance, I think. So, I join the crowd, my heart starts pounding. Eventually the soldiers let everyone cross the street, I'm in the middle of the crowd. I manage to get past the soldiers without an issue. Nice, while all the other tourists are locked away in that plaza, I'm basically walking around Pyongyang on my own, unaccompanied. So I'm just exploring, and I notice obviously a lot of Koreans are kind of staring at me because I can see I'm a Westerner, and they haven't seen many Westerners in their life to be honest. So I just try my best to keep my head down and keep going. So I see in the square there's lots of kids playing with balls and stuff. I try to get some kids to pass a ball to me, with their no success, they weren't really that eager to interact with me. Eventually though, I manage to find a crowd of kids and I convince them to toss the ball at me. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, they seem to enjoy that. I don't think they get to interact with many corners. And as they toss the ball at me, I go to headbutt it, but of course my GoPro just comes flying off and it smashes into the floor. Uh, Obviously the lens breaks. See, I'm really panicked because I'm outside of where I'm supposed to be and I think I've just broken my GoPro, the lens has come off, so I just turn off the recording at this point. This is the one time in my life I wish I was recording, but stupidly I wasn't. After I stop recording, I start walking back towards the ice sculpture plaza to get back inside when this kid sees me. And out of the hundreds of people in the plaza, he's the only one who actually had the courage to approach me. He comes up to me and says hello, and I smile and I say hi back, but it's pretty obvious that his English is really not very good at all. Obviously, he doesn't speak much English, and I have absolutely no Korean. Despite this, I try to talk to him because this is really my only chance to talk with a North Korean without having it scripted. He asks me my age, and I say I'm 20, and I ask his age, and he says he's 15. He asks me where I'm from, and he doesn't seem to understand the word Ireland, so I just explain I'm from America. He asks me what I think of Pyongyang, and I give him a neutral answer I just say oh it's very different and very interesting which is technically true pretty quickly we hit the limits of his English and we run out of things he's able to talk about this though is probably one of the most touching moments in my life for whatever reason he decides to grab my hand and he holds it tightly and he won't let it go he just stands there and stares at me it's clear he wanted to say something but wasn't because his English wasn't good enough and of course I wanted to ask him all kinds of questions about North Korea but I couldn't because my Korean wasn't really up to scratch so he keeps holding my hand and of of course we can't talk to each other because the goddamn language barrier stops us. But the kid just won't let go of my hand no matter what I do, he just keeps holding on to it. And this goes on for about two minutes and his friends have kind of gathered around and they're staring and stuff. And eventually I manage to convince him that I have to go and he of course lets go. I say bye, he says goodbye, and I guess we just go on our ways from there. It's so bizarre to think I'm probably the only foreigner he's ever seen in real life and most definitely the only one he will ever talk to in his entire life. In fact, unauthorized contact with people on the streets of North Korea is actually illegal there. It still stays with me. I really wonder what this 15 year old kid wanted to ask me but couldn't because he didn't know how to say it. And even still I wonder like how he is and what his future life will be like in North Korea. I can't even remember his name because it was some Korean name and yeah most definitely I'll never know what actually happens to him. Of course I feel sorry for him because he'll never be able to leave North Korea. Honestly kind of sad. Before I left I, I said he should study more English and I hope maybe I had some sort of positive impact on his life being the only foreigner he's ever spoken to, and I hope that maybe I was able to dispel some of the stereotypes he might have had about us. I really hope he'll be able to see past the propaganda about foreign countries and foreigners. I hope I left the impact, and I know he definitely left an impact on me. I continue on my way back towards the edge of Kim Il-sung Square, and eventually I reach the point where there's soldiers and I have to cross the street again. So I pull my hat down, I pull my scarf up, I join the middle of the crowd just like I had before, I just wait for the right moment to pass. Eventually the soldier signals everyone to move into the new plaza, and I walk, and I walk, and eventually the dude puts his arm down and blocks the crowd right where I'm I'm now at the very front row of this crowd I'm in plain sight but I just look down and try to act normal and act like I'm not really worried and not suspicious at all because the crowd had moved so far up the soldier actually tells everyone with his hands to like move back and stuff and everyone starts moving back including myself I reach the point where I'm not able to move back any further without pushing people over or hurting anybody and out of nowhere he just comes up to me and he pushes me over and I fall on my ass and of course I get back up because I was just pushed by a North Korean soldier I push myself back as far as I can to the crowd with full force. Luckily I wasn't hurt, but he didn't notice I was a foreigner because if he had, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have pushed me. But him pushing me actually got the attention of another soldier on duty and the soldier was able to see that I'm a foreigner so he reaches into the crowd and grabs me by the clothes and he pulls me out. 
At this point, I'm really worried because I know I've been caught. He knows I'm a foreigner, and I'm really not sure what will happen at this point. But luckily, he just pulls me into the ice sculpture plaza and leaves all the Koreans outside because he knows that I'm not supposed to be out there. He doesn't say anything, and I'm let back into the plaza, and I'm able to go on my own way. He obviously knew I wasn't supposed to be out there because he pulled me back in. But I count myself lucky because, you know, he could have done much worse than that. Wow, what an experience. I was actually caught outside of the plaza trying to get back in. And not only that, but I was actually pushed over by a North Korean soldier. Now, how many people can say that that's happened to them? But this experience really tells us something about North Korea. North Korean soldiers really aren't a force to be reckoned with and will get aggressive really quickly and without warning. This explains why the crowd was pushing so hard backwards. Because if they didn't, then what happened to me will probably happen to them. If you get an order from a North Korean soldier, you basically follow it or you face the consequences. Those 15 minutes after I ended the GoPro recording are some of the most dangerous and yet heart-touching moments in my life. Okay, so one major mistake I made before going to North Korea was the night before I left from Tokyo to Beijing, I was hanging out with my roommate. We were drinking and I was testing the new camera equipment I just bought. I wasn't very experienced with using cameras at this point. We were walking the streets basically early in the morning, laughing about North Korea, making jokes, and basically joking about how I'm gonna end up like Otto Warmbier or something. We said bad things about Kim Jong-un and whatnot, and I recorded a bunch of it. For some reason, I was really stubborn, didn't want to delete that footage, so I took it with me to Beijing. A few hours before my flight to Pyongyang, I realized I had to do something with this footage. I couldn't take this footage to North Korea, so I tried to upload it to Google Drive only to remember that Google is blocked in China. Plus, I don't have the upload speed to put it in the cloud before I leave to Pyongyang. I come up with this idea, which I now call a really stupid idea, and that was to actually encrypt the video. Okay, so it's about 12 hours before my flight to Pyongyang, and I've just realized I have a bit of a problem. My idea was to put these vlogs up in the cloud, that way, once I get back to Ireland, I can just download them again. But unfortunately, that's not the case because the Great Firewall of China prevents me from using sites like Dropbox or Google Drive. So basically, that means I can't put my data on the cloud, which means I'm going to have to take these vlogs with me to North Korea. So I've done a little bit of research, and this is the best solution I've come up with. So basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name of all my vlogs. I'm going to change the extensions to .dll. I'm going to encrypt that. And then I'm going to change the extension to that to .dll.mui and then I'm going to put those in the Windows registry. I'm Not only am I going to format all my drives, but once they're formatted, I'm going to overwrite them with data. That way they can't be recovered. So a little bit of a complicated security issue. And even that's not perfect. Like, at least I'll be the only one with the knowledge to decrypt those videos. But that's that's the issue you see if they do figure out like these files are taking up a lot of space if they were to happen to search my computer and basically i'm the weakest link in this chain which means the issue rests with me to protect my data if the one in 1000 chance happened that i was like detained or something and they start asking hard questions can i really trust myself not to give them the password of logs which could potentially incriminate me not only that but if i take ax crypt with me to north korea then I can actually encrypt some of the footage I have there and hide it on my PC is sort of an extra layer of security because sometimes people get their SD cards confiscated from them and I don't want that to happen to me. I definitely don't want to lose all the footage that I've taken. But of course this requires me to take the encryption software with me to North Korea which was a huge dumb mistake at this point because if it was somehow found on my computer then I would probably be sent to court for espionage or something stupid like that. I kind of counted on the computer literacy of North Korea to help me out in this sense because if they search my computer unless was an expert, they really wouldn't find anything unless they start really digging deep, they'll find these .bat folders which are like 10 gigabytes large each. At the time, I thought the risk was worth the reward, but looking back, this was the dumbest thing I could possibly do, and this was the one thing that if I was caught doing, I would have been definitely thrown in a prison camp. Don't take encryption software to North Korea. A lot of people who go to North Korea talk about how a lot of what you see there is scripted or that everyone's actors or something like that. Staged and exaggerated or even that the North Korean guides will sometimes lie to you. Naturally, this kind of sounds like a conspiracy, but realizing it's North Korea, yeah, it's possible, but I did manage to capture the North Korean charade basically falling apart right in front of me. One thing the North Koreans are bad at are computers, and when they try to use computers in front of you, even to fake their computer skills, it really shows. So this will be here are the workers of this factory. So as you can see in their free time they come here and they just were doing ebooks from their computers 
While we were at a leather factory, there was this room in the factory full of computers. We were told the computers were there for research purposes and the workers were free to use the computers whenever they want for free time or for research or for whatever, right? A closer look at what they were doing on the computers though showed that everyone in the room was learning how to type. They were using a Korean typing software. In other words, none of the Koreans there knew how to type or even use a computer properly. And it gets worse when you look at the boss in charge of the projector at the front of the room. What useful thing is he doing on his computer? Oh, he's looking at North Korean propaganda photos on a Google image search knockoff. Is this really the most useful thing they can do with the computers? And they're showing this to us to show off that they know how to use computers? Well, it's pretty obvious this room was designed as a show for tourists. In other words, those computers were never used by the workers at the factory outside of tourists visiting it, people viewing an animal inside a cage. It really was like a zoo because we were just watching them and they were just trying so hard not to look at us, just focusing on their screens and it was kind of eerie. That really says an immense amount about North Korean computer competency. Because if that's their best attempt at fooling us into thinking they can use computers, well that's just really ridiculous. And this really shows North Korea doesn't have computers, do they? Poor computer skills had further been shown in this massive library. You see in this library, there was this rocket right in the middle of it, which had launched a North Korean satellite into space. Surrounded by the rocket were thousands of computers on multiple stories of the library. These computers were basically at the center of the library and the whole design of the library was very modern and futuristic. However, only an absolutely tiny number of these computers were actually being used. And the computers that were being used were being used almost entirely by children. Walking around the library, I noticed there was two different things the kids were doing on the computers. They were either using that program to learn to type Korean or they were watching cartoons. They really weren't putting these computers to any sort of good use. Looks like most of the kids are either learning to type or they're watching videos, which is pretty cool. Like they have access to these computers because they're in Pyongyang. And besides the photo I've shown, there were more computers in a different part of the library, like absolutely hundreds of them, and there was only like two or three people using these computers. So somebody asked the question of like, where are all the people? Like uh, this place is massive and it's like, it's mostly empty and it seems just because it's New Year's Eve, uh, there's really nobody here. And considering like this place hits thousands, like it's just, it's just completely empty. One of the most bizarre things about this library and these computers is that Kim Jong-un had visited a year or two ago and he had actually sat down in one of these chairs. And this computer and chair he sat down at actually had a plaque to signify that he had sat here and basically glorified it with his presence. And even though those computers were barely being used, I'm pretty sure that particular computer, the last person who sat in it was Kim Jong-un because no one would dare disrespect him by sitting in that holy chair. I asked one of my North Korean guides how the North Korean internet works and she explained that specialists basically scour the World Wide Web and they find anything useful or productive and save it to North Korean computers. So basically anyone in North Korea with internet access only has access to these North Korean servers and all that stuff has been carefully uh, gone through. And everything including videos and movies on these North Korean servers are essentially stolen or pirated content, but I guess that's not really a law in North Korea, is it? So yeah, if you guys were wondering about the whole thing about me traveling to North Korea, well that's basically it, and yeah, I was incredibly stupid for traveling there, and I wholeheartedly regret it, that's nothing I'll ever do again, it was not worth the risk. However, something very positive actually came from me going to North Korea, and that was the fact that I'm the first one to release information about the restrictions the visitors are put under. As you guys now know, anything filmed in North Korea has to be pre-approved and only positive, whether taken by journalists, news organizations, or just ordinary people like me. Next time you see any sort of video filmed in North Korea, you now know that it is essentially propaganda because only the positive stuff was approved. Even stuff like the National Geographic documentary about skiing in North Korea is propaganda, and I guarantee you will not find anyone in North Korea make a video where they criticize their ideology or the regime itself. My whole goal with going to North Korea was getting new information that was previously unknown or unaccessible and sharing it with the world. And I've actually succeeded because by going to North Korea, I got new information, pictures and stuff that even normal people or even academics didn't previously have access to. So it tells us a little bit more about life in North Korea. Please, please, please don't go to North Korea. There is nothing to be gained by going to North Korea. All the tours in North Korea go to the exact same place, they're the exact same, and there's nothing new to be gained by actually going through these tours. 
you're just going on the same thing that everyone else has before. But if you really, really do want to experience the North Korean tour, there's plenty of videos on YouTube which will show you exactly the same thing as you can experience. Remember, this is a really dangerous country with one in 266 Americans being put in labor camps in a particular year. Otto Warmbier is dead. There are massive risks and no reward. Don't go to this country. It's as simple as that, and that's what Fun for Louis should have told you guys. Listen guys, I need you to do one thing. Please download this video and save it to your hard drive. I can almost guarantee this video is going to get taken down, so you have my full permission if it gets taken down to go re-upload it anywhere you want. Keep this video alive if it gets taken down. This video will not be censored. Remember, I signed a contract which prohibits unauthorized video like this. However, it states in that contract that it's technically only valid in Hong Kong and not in Ireland or anywhere else I filmed the video. So I really don't think it legally applies at all. This video took an incredibly long time to produce from the idea to traveling, to filming, to scripting, to commentating, to recording video footage, to editing that footage and getting it out on YouTube. In fact, the whole thing from idea to final product took over one year. Now, if you think I did the right thing by making this video, spending my time on it and releasing this new information, subscribing is what allows and pushes me to release censored information like this. Now, a lot of you don't even know that I have a Twitter and you'd be surprised the amount of crazy stuff that goes on in the background of a video that no one really knows about, that people really should know about. So if you do actually use Twitter, you may as well follow me at VexB4C because you will learn about all this crazy stuff that goes on in the background. I also do have an Instagram where I post professional photography. If you'd like, like a pretty photo or something on your Instagram timeline, like once a day, you can follow me at VexB4C on Instagram. I do high quality live streaming on Twitch. I do like IRL outdoors and talking with people and interacting in cities and traveling. So if you do watch Twitch, I'm just on twitch.tv slash VexB4C. You should follow me because otherwise you really won't know when I'm live and you won't get to experience the stream. I also have a Discord where I talk to fans, discord.gg slash vexed. And I do also reply to all messages on Twitter. My DMs are open if you have any questions or request any video footage that I have of the raw video. And please guys, consider subscribing because odds are if you don't subscribe, you'll never be recommended one of my videos and you'll probably never see another one of my videos again. And I'll just be gone because that's how the algorithm works. So if you're not subscribed, this might be the last chance you have to see me. This has been an incredible journey, a long project. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and have a wonderful day. <sighs> Ooh, glad that's over.